Hi, I'm Dan Ligotti with Silver Solutions, the senior focused home services company. Thanks for joining us for another episode of AgeWise. Today, we dig into part two of the two-part show that we did on longevity with a guest that we sat down with a couple of weeks back, Dr. Nir Barzilai. If you heard part one, it was extraordinary, and this promises to be just as interesting as we dig in with our guest, who is the founding director of the Institute for Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He's also the scientific director at AFAR, the American Federation of Aging Research, and the author of the book, Age Later. Some of the things we talk about in this episode include a trial coming up with metformin, which is thought of as one of the miracle drugs to actually reverse aging and increase somebody's health span. We also take a look at his role with AFAR, and we ask the ultimate question about three things that everybody can and should be doing today to extend their quality of life. So sit back and enjoy part two of our special episode of AgeWise on longevity with our guest, Dr. Nir Barzilai. One of the things that I know is very important to you currently is a study called TAME, and it involves metformin. Could you give us your perspective on what you're trying to do there and a little more details on what metformin actually is? We hear a lot about it in the news. Is it a miracle drug? What, what, are, you, what are you looking towards there? So as a geroscientist, I'm trying to uh, implement or develop gerotherapeutics. And really the, the best gerotherapeutics that we have is this drug that's called metformin, that is an extract of a French lilac, but it's modulated, so it needs a doctor prescription. And metformin has been used in the 1920s, 1950s, to treat arthritis, to prevent flu, to prevent malaria, um, and, and for many other indications when it was found to lower uh, glucose level in diabetics. So it became an anti-diabetic drug. But it's really not only an anti-diabetic drug, it's a, it's a geroscience drug. I should tell you, it was used to prevent the flu we know now from nine studies around the world that people on metformin ha had let less hospitalization and death from COVID. And in, even in clinical trials where people were assigned, they were not on metformin, less hospitalization, less death, about 50%, and less long COVID, 50% less long COVID. And that's why TAME is designed mainly to show the FDA that we are targeting aging and by that preventing not one, not two, not three, but three kind of diseases and, and convince them that, and by the way, metformin is the cheapest drug in the formulary, okay? And convince them and co convince health, healthcare providers, let's start, okay? This drug is available. It's probably going to make you healthy for several years on average, some people more, some people less. Let, let's do it and then let's, have a horizon for the pharmaceuticals, for the biotech to develop those better drugs and the combinations. One of the questions that comes out of that uh, description for me is, we go down a couple of years, you've succeeded, the FDA acknowledges the fact that it improves, I guess in your terms, health span, reverses the effects of aging. So is it the drug that is right at every age, or is it not right for a 20-year-old, but it's right for an 85-year-old? Th that's a fabulous question. You know, part of what happened, what happened in aging and evolution is that uh, there, we, we call it the antagonistic pleotrophy hypothesis of aging. Some things that are good for you when you're young are turning against you when you're old. You know, you need cholesterol to develop your brain and cells and gonads but when you have high cholesterol when you're old, your, your coronaries get into, in, in the way, right? So that's an example. And it's the opposite also. So things that can be good for you when you're old are not good for you when you're young. And metformin is an example because metformin does several things. Some of them are not good for young body, although they're great for young body, for, for old body. So, so old body needs less, for example, a growth hormone. B12 
because you don't want to spend your energy growing when you're starting to breaking down. You have to shift this energy. But growth hormone, when you're young, is really good for you. It's really protective for you. So all the studies about metformin uh, in humans are on people who are at least 50 years old. And I would say that if you're younger than that, unless you have di diabetes, you shouldn't be on metformin. One of the other associations that you have is with a group called AFAR, A-F-A-R. I believe it's the American Federation of Aging Research. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, and not only that, I'm the scientific director of AFAR, but let me, let, let me tell you, first of all, when I was trying to convert from endo endocrinologists, from a specialist in metabolism and diabetes to aging, AFAR is the one that gave me my first grant in 1996, a $35,000 grant that helped me get then my first NIH grant. It also interfered again with my life when uh, they actually converted people from other fields into these fields with a more substantial uh, help of, I think it was $750,000 over three years, which really helped me build. And basically the, invest the investment of $35,000 has now resulted in the fact that I had probably something like $40 million of grants throughout the years. So if you're looking at the business from a business point of view, this, is a great, uh, this was a great success. Uh, so what FAR is doing now is taking young people, postdocs and early faculty and giving them grants in order to allow them this hard time to get them to a more substantial grant and independent. But more important for me, there are three initiatives that FAR is doing. Those are initiatives that you cannot do as a single person or with a single uh, grant. One of them you've mentioned is this TAME study to prove to the FDA that aging can be targeted. The second is the Super Agers Initiative, and that is taking our knowledge and, and, and amplifying and then validating it by 10,000 um, families of centenarians that will know all their genetics and, and can probably develop better and more drugs. And the third one is really something that has to do with biomarkers of aging. You know, I wish there was a cholesterol-like measurement that we can say, okay, here, you're 50 years old, and according to our test, you're 40 years old, so forget colonoscopy for now, okay? Or if you're 60 years old, let, let's try and get something, uh, let's correct something. So we're doing an initiative of um, drugs that were given, gerotherapeutics that were given, to look not only what's the biomarkers of aging, but what change with treatment. So we can have those biomarkers and develop drugs rapidly and see if they fail before we spend billion dollars in a phase three trial. Spend a second and tell us about your book, Age Later. Uh, it was, it's been out for what, a, a little over two years. Was it written for uh, academics? Was it written for people that are in the medical community or for consumers that are interested in, in, in living a better life? What, what was the, the, the motivation and, and who do you think it targets? A Age Later was written for lay people and it's really written uh, coming in and out of the centenarians and, and some of the data of centenarians we took to the labs and, and you know, so we went back to animals. And it's really to give uh, some of the stories that have led the geroscience field to what it is, give you a flavor uh, of why we're uh, believing that this is a big revolution and why it will be successful. Uh, you can skim through chapters if you want to uh, the read about the growth hormone issue that I just described, you can go through that. If you want to read about the life of centenarians, you can go uh, and read about the life of centenarians. If you want to get more advices of what you can do, you could find it there. And I, I'd say the, the book uh, is evergreen. In other words, people are reading it. It's, it's not 2020 and now we need to update it. The book is evergreen. 
People are buying it all the time. It's a soft cover now. <laughs> People want to translate it all over the world. And 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 I and I I, I think for lay people it's really um, it's it's really it's a fun it was a fun book to write to write it's more of stories and less of hard uh, data and if you have hard data you can skip. I could go on not just for another hour but for an entire twelve week semester listening to you talk about all of the things that you're involved with and that are happening in the world of uh, longevity. So I'm going to ask you perhaps the hardest question last, which is take your wealth of knowledge and help our viewers with one thing. And that is sitting here today, what are the three most important things that anybody that has an older parent or that may be older themselves should be focused on to improve their health span uh, while all of the other developments take place? Yes, I, I think... Uh... The, the the first thing is to actually uh, tune in and 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 see when gerotherapeutics are going to be approved and be first in line. Uh, but what you can do what what you can do right now for elderly is move. Okay, move. Now, if you can exercise, it's okay, but it's really about movement. You're not stuck in a chair. You're going to move and make move part of what you need to do because any movement is going to improve the health. Uh, of course, if you get a Fitbit or if you get an iPhone, you can monitor your movement. You can see how many steps you're doing a day and you should uh, try and do more and more all the time. The second is diet, and diet is a little bit more complicated, but one of the things that the gero scientists are doing is doing intermittent fasting. It's changing the time instead of eating 16 hours a day and then going to sleep, actually fasting 16 hours a day. Part of it is by sleep and just eating during eight hours. When we do it to animals, they live 40% longer and, and much healthier. And this is for me much more important than deciding which diet to do. It also helps me maintain my, my weight. The sleep part is you have to be eight hours in a room, even if you don't sleep for the eight hours, but it has to be a dark room without your electronic, without the lights, and, and try to get as much sleep as you can. And lastly, it's social interaction. I mean, what happened during COVID was terrible, the way that the elderly were isolated. Um, I have a centenarian who is 106 years old, and she one day stopped eating and drinking during COVID because she was lonely. Uh, uh, so this is this is terrible. All those things are things that you can uh, move them. Move. <laughs> I said move already, but you know, em employ all of them, and they are all going to improve health at any age for anyone. Dr. Nir Barzilai from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Thanks so much for joining us today on AgeWise, a terrific conversation and one that I'm personally going to listen to over and over again. If you like today's episode, please share it with a friend. If you want to see back episodes, you can find them at silversolutions.com and just click the video tab to see the entire library. And if you want to get each new episode of AgeWise when it comes out, go to the Apple Podcast platform and subscribe. I'm Dan Lagani. For all of us at Silver Solutions who work hard every day to help keep your loved ones safer and better living longer, thanks so much for joining us. Stay safe and be wise.